Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer at Geek Vibes Nation. I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for geekvibesnation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic new release roundup. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Um, what we do is we go back and forth and we talk about the latest home video releases, uh, some fantastic, some bad, some awful. But you know what? We have a great time talking about them. And I hope it's fun for y'all to watch us kind of di dissect some of these uh, movies. I definitely have some weird ones. I know you have some interesting ones. But um, we're going to kick it off here <laughs> with... Um... What a flourish. What a flourish. <laughs> it's Pride Month. We, got, we need a little pizzazz. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're both looking spiffy today. Um, <laughs> so I want to kind of start this on a high note. Um, something that was a really fun discovery, and that is A Life on the Farm. Um, and this is from Draft House Films. Um, here's the back. We have some um, really nice features and commentary tracks. Um, no, sorry, scratch that. Uh, some interviews. Um, and uh, yes, now have you seen this? Yes, I posted my Blu-ray review on the site like about a week ago. Um, okay, but I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, so I really liked it. Um, there, so um, there was a recent documentary. I won't mention it because it's not um, the review is not out yet. And I kind of thought that it was fun. But then there was a sort of disconnect with me with the tonal balance. And I think um, this is where this movie really thrives. Um, it is a very like the quick premises. Um, there is these sort of VHS tapes of this like old eccentric farmer named Charles. Charles Carson, <laughs> two men farm. This farmer, Charles Carson, a neighbor of my grandparents made this feature length home movie. Hey, what are you doing here? And um, things start out just kind of weird, but then it gets kind of bizarre. And um, they uh, kind of dissect um, Charles and his life and, and what might have kind of led him to um, create these films and how these films are now being recontextualized as like underground art, um, which I think is, is one of the most fascinating aspects of this um, outside of just how wonderfully weird um, this guy was. Um, so um, yeah, I thought it was really uh, fun. Again, there is a morbid aspect. Um, Charles had um, elderly parents. Like this needs a lot of context, but he had some elderly parents on the farm who passed away. So he would like pose them um, for like photos and videos and stuff. And yeah, I, I think like to a lot of our sensibilities, that's like weird um, and maybe even a little disturbing, if not a lot disturbing. But when they when they talk about it as a way of his grieving or processing um i think it, it kind of doesn't derail that tone where you're like oh i thought this guy was really cool and charming and you know quirky and now he's like playing with dead bodies but again i think the filmmakers do a really great job of putting that in the proper context and you know he kind of lives in his own world so this is kind of his way of processing heavy things like life and death. And that's kind of what his art really was about. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, it was cool to see the uh, Chop and Steal from um, the, the Chop and Steal documentary. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on their names. Uh, I even interviewed them. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it was cool seeing them, um, you know, in the uh, interviews. And yeah, it was just really interesting. I thought it was bizarre but again there was a tonal um like wholeness that i think makes it kind of work uh, when with lesser filmmakers i think it would be a stumbling block with some of the weirder kind of elements to you know charles's again i'm going to call it art because that's what that's what it is it's you know him making his own kind of outsider art so yeah i thought it was fun i thought it was a really 
nice breezy 75 minutes long so it's not a huge time investment and uh yeah i, I really uh, enjoyed it yeah i and i want to uh give a heads up i know uh there the uh, true crime uh, fandom is like huge. Um, and one of the interview subjects in this one is Karen Kilgariff from the hit podcast, uh, My Favorite Murder. So mm -hmm. if you're a fan of that podcast, Karen shows up in this, which I was delighted to see her. So this one is a, a really interesting documentary that just like goes some into some wild places, like even beyond what you've described. So I'm yeah, because we don't want to give everything away. There are some kind of fun little things. I didn't even talk about the skeletons, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I think, you know, definitely you all should check it out. Um, you know, I, I think, I believe it's a pretty widely available on VOD if you want to try before you buy. But, you know, Trapped House always puts out really quality stuff. So um, they're a label that if they put something out, I'm probably going to really enjoy it. So absolutely uh sticking on the uh slightly creepy train um this one is a huge uh title for us uh i know a lot of our audience will be excited about this, this is a new 4k release from screen factory of creep show mm -hmm. yes which surprisingly this was my first viewing of this i had never seen any creep show <laughs> films so i was very excited that this was getting a 4k release uh so let me see i don't think there's doubles oh there is double-sided art that's cool um so here is the alternative so you kind of get the uh kind of comic booky vibes over here um and this is a two disc set and thankfully i had never bought this previously so i don't feel like i <laughs> like i'm just double dipping all the time but um let me get this in safely Okay, um, so you have the, the creeper over here and the other disc over here. Um, so yeah, uh, my my first viewing of this was fun. I, I really love horror anthology films and this is among the strongest that I've uh, seen. I really like the uh, Tales from the Dark Side movie that Screen Factory also put out a few years ago. Um, but then I can now watching this, I'm just like, okay, this is just like a, like a slightly upper tier version of that. Cause of course you have like Dario Argento, uh, like doing stuff and, uh, like Stephen King's involvement and all that stuff. So I really liked like kind of this, like structure of this and I'll, I'll touch on this with my next title, just like a young boy, um, like, uh, kind of in like a unstable household and he's just wanting to like, read these like this comic series and then like you kind of get like go through these vignettes and stuff uh or these like little uh slices i would say they're all pretty strong i like it's a little bit silly uh i but the stephen king one with like uh, him having like basically like moss grow all over him and stuff from that alien uh source or whatever that was like one of my lower tier, but uh, I still liked it quite a bit. Uh, my favorites were probably the crate with the creature. I thought that was a lot of fun. And I have, uh, maybe because I like Ted Danson so much, but I like the one uh, where he's buried up to his neck on the beach. Cringe. Uh, but I think all, all of the, all the pieces of this story are like this film are pretty entertaining um i i like all the practical special effects um it has a good tone between like kind of the macabre and the the like humor and just like there's a lot of really like big names to me and then like also some like actual genuine names within it like i love seeing how holbrook uh show up in the crate uh short um he always has like a like a soft spot in my heart for him. I love him, but a uh, very entertaining movie. I've heard about it uh, all these years. I've seen the TV show, but I just never seen the movie. So I'm glad to like kind of go back to the source. Um, so yeah, this is a classic and I'm glad it got a 4K release. For, by, I, like I said, I haven't owned this before, but by all accounts, the previous Screen Factory release was pretty solid. This comes from a new, uh, like an even newer 4K restoration of the original camera negative. Um, this is pre uh, presented in Dolby Vision and it looks really nice. It's a really solid transfer. 
um really deep black levels which there's a lot of shadowy moments in this so you like don't have any like uh compression artifacts or black crush or anything uh really crisp detail like on a lot of the like gnarly texture of some of the special effects this also has the a new dolby atmos uh soundtrack which not all the screen factory 4k uh releases get audio upgrades but this one does but they also do include the 5.1 and the 2.0 uh like soundtracks as well so if you want like original sound or new like all immersive sound you're covered um and uh this one actually it splits up the special features between the 4k disc and the blu-ray but i believe it just ports over all the previous special features i think they're probably trying to like cut down on like having a three disc set but um the transfer doesn't um uh get compromised because there's like some special features on the 4k disc it looks really nice um there's like uh there's um four commentary tracks so uh, Pretty much everything you'd want to know is covered in those four commentary tracks, but there's also a roundtable interview, uh, various other uh, individual interviews, um, a piece on the filming locations, a bunch of some of the marketing is like explored and just a lot of really great stuff is packed onto this set. Um, if you're a fan, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I do really love this cover art. Um, and yeah, it's just a great release all around. Glad it's in my life now. So uh, horror fans, it just fans of film in general. This is a good release from Scream Factory Creep Show. Yeah, it's definitely a favorite of mine. Um, I'll have uh, our editor Andre put it on, up on the screen, but I have a DVD that's signed by George Romero and a couple other oh. from Creep Show. And um, yeah, um, if I'm trying to, well, can, there one question I have um, just to confirm: it does not include the, the Just Desserts documentary. Is that right? like the 2000s i um i don't think yeah. so was that on their previous release no but i just wanted just in case anybody was curious they that wasn't they weren't able to port that over in this new um release no i don't think they added any additional special features okay. that were not on the one that came out like in 2018 i believe okay um yeah i was just curious and i okay. figured maybe somebody maybe some other people were but yeah, that sounds like an awesome release. Um, I'm a big fan. Um, I guess we're going to bring it down a little bit, um, unfortunately. Um, although, I mean, this I think this has a cult following, so maybe people might dig this, but I really didn't. <laughs> um, it is Warner Archives' um, The Boy with the Green Hair. In Technicolor. So you get that Technicolor green hair. Um, and, um, you get a short, um, subject, uh, as a, as a bonus feature, but, um, yeah, so this is a weird movie. Did you see this one yet? Yeah, I, I liked it more than you did, but I'm, I'm interested to hear your reasons why, <laughs> why you did. I, I, I understand, but I, okay. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I didn't hate it. There was just, um, a lot I didn't like about it, but anyways, um, Right. Uh, I'm going to start out by, uh, you know, very much paraphrasing a Roger Corman quote, um, which is uh, when you're making a movie, uh, the entertainment value should come first and the message second. And um, I feel like this movie did not get that memo. <laughs> um, this is just an extremely heavy handed anti-war film. And while I think that is a great message, I think that is, is com completely a valid thing to have it it's just it kind of overwhelms the film and i feel like it's just sort of i, I feel like i'm not watching a, an entertaining an entertaining movie i feel like i'm watching a lecture um and oh, it's just it it just gets really not subtle at all like there's a moment where the titular boy with the green hair uh who plays played by a young dean stockwell um, he, um, enters this, like, creepy forest or whatever, and there's a clearing, and there's, like, all these, like, kids in this, like, burnout rubble kind of thing, and I'm like, are they supposed to be, are they in his head? Are they supposed to be ghosts? Are these ghost children he's interacting with? I mean, what, what is going on? Now, the one thing I will say that is interesting, um, the framing device of this, is, this is mostly told in flashback, 
um, this kid is telling this, relaying this story to um, Robert Ryan, um, who I think he was at, like at a police station or something. And so he's like um, bald. He actually kind of looks like a young Lex Luthor, like a younger <laughs> yeah. Lex Luthor. And the thing is, we don't know if this these events are really happening or happened or if this is just like a made up thing that this kid's like just relaying to this uh, cop. But while I find that interesting, it is a little inconsistent. Like you never really know, like, like the internal logic of the film is not that great because it, it doesn't have to be because it's trying to push this message and that's where I feel like it slides into it's not enough care is actually put into the movie it's more about the message and again that's not always a bad thing I'm not saying that but it's just like I frankly just was exhausted and didn't care and um I don't know what do you think yeah I like I said I liked it more than you did I didn't I kind of just took it at like T took it on as a fable so like mm -hmm. whether this was real or not real was really beside the point i just kind of uh enjoyed learning like i i was uh intrigued to learn why this boy's hair had turned green and just uh like the the cover art even implores you not to tell people once you've seen the boy with green hair why why his hair turned green but I was just like, oh, okay, this is what this movie is. And, but I just, uh, yeah, it is kind of heavy handed, but just like the message of just like, um, like feeling kind of like isolated and like othered and I don't know, it works for me. I just, I thought it was an entertaining movie. It's not overly long or anything. So I didn't feel like it was too like drawn out or anything. And it just kind of, I like kind of just the more kind of magical feel of it. Like it just kind of seemed fairy tale esque which uh, i was just on i was on board with the vibes but i understand if you were just like this movie it's ridiculous it is ridiculous but i enjoyed it yeah i mean i listen i'm all about some whimsy okay i just thought like i don't like when i i watch a movie and i feel like i'm being preached to or like you're trying like you're clearly trying to get a message across and again that's fine back to the roger corman quote i want the entertainment first and then I want, you know, if you're a really good filmmaker, you can you can hammer home that message in a way that doesn't feel like hitting me over the head with a sledgehammer. And I mean, the ghost kids that just kind of like put me over the edge. I'm like, I mean, I don't think they're I don't know if they're supposed to be ghosts or he just had a psychotic break. But I'm just I'm, I'm going with if we're getting into the whimsy, I'm getting into he just saw a bunch of dead kids. Your green hair is very beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Green is the color of spring. It means hope. They're the magical kids of the forest, okay? <laughs> They're there to prophesy about the horrors of the of war. Damn. And they were like literally like you need to keep your green hair because you are a, a living, breathing symbol of anti war. And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> now you're just straight up spoiling stuff, Mike. Come on, the cover art tells you not to to tell people. <laughs> Well, I just see. But also, I do feel the messaging is. I I do feel the messaging is probably as heavy handed as it is because it is, it is made for children and it's just kind of like, hey, children, take What's these that? lessons away because the adults have screwed up the world and we want you to be better. <laughs> but yeah, I, it, it's hard is definitely in the right place, and I, I mean it is. It is an interesting movie. I I wasn't bored, and I do think even though I'm wasn't feeling it, I think it is worth checking out. It's just, yeah, it was uh, something. <laughs> All right. I won't, I won't belabor the point. We, we just have a difference of opinion. Uh, but uh, on to another whimsical uh, children's mm -hmm. tale. Um, this is the new 4k ultra HD release from the criterion collection of time bandits complete with lenticular cover uh so if i've seen this one it's been a long time and i didn't really remember it but i was excited to check it out because it's been one i like terry gilliam and i 
I've been wanting to rewatch this ever since I um, reviewed this um, this documentary a few years ago called The Accidental Studio about uh, handmade films. Uh, and I, I can link my review to that on the, uh, the description. But uh, so now with this 4K release, it seemed to be like the perfect time for this. So um, there's not really, there's the interior is kind of like this maze. I think you can see a little bit here. Um, and so here is the Blu-ray disc. And uh, I think you could see the 4K disc before, but I'll show it off again. Uh, the all-powerful being is spoke uh, featured on there, and then this also comes with a uh, booklet that kind of unfolds. So you have this here it unfolds, uh, and you have it unfolds into the uh, the map. The map from it's probably upside down from the uh, the feature the map that they're kind of like following, and then there's also. On the other side, there's all the like the essays that come with it. So a lot of essay stuff here. <laughs> um, so pretty solid packaging from this. Um, this is pretty much a reproduction of the uh, the Blu-ray version, which I also had from the Criterion Collection, complete with the lenticular cover. Uh, but I wanted to upgrade. Um, wh whenever I was talking about Creep Show, I found it interesting how that one. It starts with like a, ch a child in like kind of a unhappy home that's like kind of like in disarray. And that is like the exact same setup for Time Bandits where there's like a, like his parents are kind of watching TV, almost kind of zombified by kind of like what they're taking in. They kind of like treat the boy poorly and just like send him off to bed, like kind of thoughtlessly and all this stuff but until like one night, like a, a knight on a horse bursts through the kids, like, uh, like a uh, closet, like closet door. And it kind of like, like shakes him out of kind of like this, like a slumber and then kind of like disappears. But then the next night, um, like this gang of uh, thieves, uh, uh, like a group of uh, little people who are just like, they're traveling through time, uh, like having um, uh, committing heists and stuff. Uh, he ends up going with them, like on this like kind of larger than life adventure um, uh, through time, meeting like a bunch of different interesting figures, like um, like meet Robin Hood and uh, I believe it's Agamemnon from like the like uh, like Greece, Grecian times, like ancient Greece, and like Napoleon is one of the first. Uh, um, uh figures you see so uh this is completely my shit like uh pulled off flawlessly i would say but the story itself like that kind of like high concept adventure like it's just like completely what i want from a story i i it's kind of like a less silly version of bill and ted's excellent adventure <laughs> uh but i just like love like the, this kid and these group of like bandits just like going through time meeting all these interesting figures a bunch of them are played by like Monty Python members because Terry Gilliam is from Monty Python for those who don't know which I don't know why you wouldn't but uh like yeah John Cleese as Robin Hood and um uh, uh Michael Palin he doesn't play anyone like historical but he's also in there just a bunch of the pythons are in there um and there's a lot of really great practical effects uh visual effects like uh that were of the time that were pretty cutting edge um all pulled off really well it's a very entertaining adventure um there are a few like some of the jokes aren't that they don't completely hold up and um it's not quite as like laugh a minute as i may have wanted but it's always entertaining at, at like on some level and i do think it's just a really good movie and i especially during this time of terry gilliam is kind of like more what i'm drawn to not his like work in the last 20 years or so but time bandits baron munchausen 12 monkeys brazil like all that kind of era is what i'm more drawn to and so this was this was a good uh, watch for sure. And this is like from the Criterion Collection. This is from a, a 4K restoration. Um, it does come in Dolby Vision. This has um, the original uh, 2.0 LPCM audio. Um, sounds really great. The Dolby Vision looks really nice. Um, uh, kind of comparing it to the old Blu-ray, there's a really nice refinement and bump in detail. Uh, the grain's handled a little bit more consistently. The color's a little bit more richer um and the audio sounds about the same so it's always been pretty solid so i uh uh 
think the audio is really good. This does come with a commentary track, um, primarily Terry Gilliam with other uh, members of the cast and creative team spliced in throughout. Um, this has like a 24 minute uh, featurette on like the production design and costumes. There's an 80 minute conversation with Terry Gilliam from uh, 1998, which there's a similar conversation that was on uh, that was on the uh, 12 Monkeys disc uh, from Aero Video. So it's another really lengthy conversation with Terry Gilliam. Um, which is real. I love having that on here. And then there's also other very special features, but uh, yeah, Criterion did a really good job with this. They've been like, they just released Baron Munchausen back in January. I'm sure Fear and Loathing in Brazil are right, right around the corner. Um, some of them have been released by uh, Era Video overseas, but they haven't made domestic debuts on 4K. So um, really excited about that. Glad they're clearing through his stuff. And yeah, it's a really good release. Nice. Um, yeah, that is definitely like up there in my I feel bad I've never seen it, actually. Mm -hmm. So just like you, Remedy Creep Show, I need to, you know, work that out and, and finally watch that. But mm -hmm. I feel like with my next title, I want some Warner Archive redemption. OK, okay. we mm -hmm. love Warner Archive. And even if I don't really jive with the movie like they're product is overall really great um so my next title is um, border incident and um this is really cool because this does have a um commentary track which i also really enjoyed um so this is a really interesting film because i think that it's amazingly timely with um you know about illegal people crossing into the border um, this, again, is a very hotly debated topic even now, but I think the legendary Anthony Mann um, does a really great job at crafting a white knuckle thriller and also injecting um, social commentary, which, you know, unlike the last movie, I think wasn't too heavy handed or preachy, but I think it did really kind of hammer home, you know, what it's like to, you know, struggle to find a better life and um it doesn't i don't feel like it ever really condemns people trying to cross over um but i mean the stance is that you should do it like through legal channels but i again i like how it's never like oh they're awful people for doing this they never really like you know man never really like judges anyone it's just very like matter of fact um and i have to say like holy crap this is a thrilling movie like 95 minutes it, it's like the pacing is next level great are you looking for somebody why do you want to go with your noblesse maybe i like some American dollars. Maybe I'm running from something. You may be one of the police. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo uh, Montalban is amazing in this. Um, he just has this like charisma that just oozes off the screen. Um, and and uh, this movie looks fantastic. It has a very noir look. Um, and um, it's fitting because DP John Alton was an Oscar winning um, DP and also did um, some pretty famous noirs like the big combo. And, you know, his the the um, photography in this is just very in your face and sometimes really intense. And I think it just, um, you know, the pairing between Alton and man was was such a great uh, collaboration because I believe they worked together before on some some um, other films um, and uh, yeah this movie looks great um, I don't know if you have any information on if this was like a new 2k but it looks flawless uh, it really is a beautiful looking black and white film there are some films that I think like actually thrive in black and white and this is a very moody very gritty crime drama um 
that works really well with like this, the the light and shadows, the, you know, again, very noir expressionistic low lighting. Um, really fantastic. It's something that I would, would easily recommend if you are a, a fan of noir. I don't know if it's strictly noir, but it's like, it's definitely a crime thriller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I I really like that one. It's a very entertaining movie. The only uh, slight pet peeve of mine, and this happened uh, with other um, uh, Anthony Mann directed films, I I believe he did. He's done a few with John Alton, like you said. I believe that classic flicks put out. I've covered a few. I think mm -hmm. one of them was T Men, which did a similar framing oh, yeah. device, which I wasn't a fan of. That uh, that uh, is um, that kind of like overbearing narration at the beginning that's just kind of like mm -hmm. here we are doing like this is the stuff about i'm just like just tell this like let the story tell itself but like it's a very small part of the movie i just that was just kind of like a convention of the time like a procedural like biographical like news like crime story that i didn't really like but everything else that, about the movie i pretty much i like, really like the only other kind of pet peeve i have is there's a very thrilling moment. I won't spoil it. Where there's seen, there's a character that is in peril, and I was just like, oh, "Okay, he's about to be saved because this thing is like there's a lot of time for this person to be saved." And then they just watch this person <laughs> die, and I'm just like, "How did you not save this person? There's so much time. What did you do?" <laughs> it was thrilling, but it just kind of like blew my mind. I was like, "Why are you not jumping to action?" <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. And it's funny because like I'm so used to these like narrations with these kind of films that it almost just felt like didn't feel weird or out of place. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I definitely like I, I it probably would have bothered me more if it had if it had been like the entire film. Um yeah. like you said, mercifully it's only a little bit at the beginning. Um but um yeah gosh i liked it a lot I'm, I'm a big anthony mann fan like he um like you said did, did some noirs classic flicks um uh they did like it was what t-men there was like a, two other films uh in this yeah, like uh, i'm not sure if in man directed but i know like uh he walked by night which mm -hmm. i believe uh kino is going to be putting out on 4k in the near future yeah. mm -hmm. And there's another one because there's like a John Alton collection that Classic Flicks put out that I think might be out of print now, but they like uh, brought together a lot of his stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. I was looking up uh, what what this scan was. Um, this uh, is a 4K scan of the preservation safety fine grain. Um, and so this was one of the uh, the original negative was one of the ones that uh got burned up in the Eastman house fire. So this is kind of like, uh, luckily they had a backup uh, that they could like do a really nice scan on. So uh, this is definitely like, while it's not the original camera negative, it is the best that's ever looked on home entertainment. And I do think it looks really great. Like that moody uh, noir photography definitely shines on this disc. Um, but Moving on, staying in the crime uh, family, uh, I am going to do the newest one from Radiance Films. You know, I love them. I talk about them a lot. Um, it is the upcoming release of The Iron Prefect, uh, which is an Italian crime film uh, based on a, a real life uh, person. And I will show off the packaging a little bit. So um, as always, uh, Radiance has this little, I believe it's called an uh, OBI strip uh, that you can kind of remove that has all the information on it, leaving a very uh, nice and clean uh, front cover art here and then the back as well. Um, and then there's also a reversible cover art, uh, which you can see here with the original Italian title and then there. Uh, and uh, the interior is, we have the standard, this, uh, the disc and the booklet, which this is technically a limited edition. Um, uh, Radiance, I think does like uh, 2000 copies originally. 
um, uh, yeah, limited edition, 2000 copies. So uh, a pretty good number, but these have been selling out and they've been repressing them without the booklet and stuff. So if you do care about booklets and all this cool information, um, it is worth picking it up sooner rather than label. And then at the same time, you are supporting a, uh, a label that's doing really cool stuff that just started up this year. And so, yeah, definitely recommend you picking it up sooner rather than later. Uh, but this one is pretty solid. This is a story. It's set in, I believe it's either the late 1800s or early 1900s. And it's about, I believe it's Mussolini who sends this detective slash just like force of nature um to this uh area of the country in italy where there's like an extreme amount of mafia activity and it's like really brought down the quality of life in the area and this is basically someone who has come in, like who is sent in to basically play by his own rules and basically smash some skulls and get like the mafia in ship shape and like basically like hey we're not gonna take any of your shit anymore you always had to do it your way fuck you we're gonna take you out <laughs> and he's just gonna burst into the scene and it's really cool that this is like based on a real life person and an event um so this is pr like i i talk about a lot of italian crime thrillers i'm going to be talking about another one later in this episode because there's so many that's been coming out the past few years but what's what i really found interesting about this one is like the setting and like the time period because I don't believe I've ever really thought about like seeing an Italian crime film where they're like, there's people riding around on horseback a lot of the time. So it's kind of like has elements of a Western uh, mixed with like it's kind of those more modern elements of like high powered guns and stuff. So. It's a really interesting story. Um, the lead actor and the character he portrays is very compelling just seeing how he is trying to protect the people of this like this uh like kind of little town uh while it's taking on these like vicious like mafia members just that balance while also kind of contending with his his larger place within his own government and how he is like kind of um he's not fighting for fascism which i think this um this uh movie got a little bit criticized for downplaying the real life man's uh, connections to fascism and how much he like had kind of indulged in those tendencies but he is kind of also kind of like stuck in this like weird political place of like uh, serving on behalf of Mussolini and uh, so there's like a weird gray area which the movie does address in some instances but uh, overall this is just a really solid Italian crime flick and I like kind of like that it is based on a real life uh, uh, kind of event this comes from a new K restoration of the original camera negative. Um, it comes with a couple of good documentaries. There's a 35 minute documentary on the, um, the director. There's a 45 minute um, biography on the uh, star. And then there's a 12 minute appreciation piece from uh, Alex Cox, who I know you have your, your issues with Alex, but um, uh, he, uh, he, provides some uh, fairly decent information. I prefer like the longer kind of 35 to 40 minute pieces that has a lot more like uh, richer information, but um, overall really well-rounded package. Another uh, home run from Radiance Films, really love what they're doing. And so yeah, Italian crime film enthusiasts definitely have this on your radar. Iron Prefect. Uh, yeah, that sounds really interesting. I need to like that's a label that uh, it's so cool that you're able to cover because they always have some really interesting um, titles and yeah, I'm always down for a good like crime thriller that kind of, you know, segues nicely into my next title, which is the film noir dark side of cinema. And here's the back and uh, yeah. So um yeah, another uh, stellar set, some really interesting ones, some ones that are like, mm, maybe a little so-so, but uh, I definitely have a favorite in here, um, which I'm really excited to talk about, but uh, I'll actually say that one for last. Um, okay. So maybe one of my least favorite ones is Undercover Girl. Just because, uh, as you can probably tell, the whole sort of like, whoa, whoa, what? Oh, a, a lady police officer doing undercover work? 
like it's very that i mean this is 1950 and i and i am kind of just giving this movie a little bit of a hard time but um it is there's it's tricky to talk about because there is some twists that i like that i don't want to spoil but um it does sort of rely heavily on this novelty which again always sort of makes me feel a little icky but um I think the actors really do a good job of kind of trying to break out of this sort of box standard crime thriller. And again, there is a few twists and elements that did keep me engaged overall. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but um, it's really well shot too. I mean, I, I, I love how some of these like more like B films actually look really stellar and this is a really nice looking um presentation overall um there is a really great commentary track that i think also sort of addresses these sort of gender roles and um basically just kind of like puts into context sort of the time and the place this was made um which i will say actually didn't help me appreciate the film a little bit more like going forward um one Way Street um, is starring James Mason. And I like this a little bit more. I thought it was really, um, I'm sorry, here's the back. We do have a commentary track. Um, and I thought this was a little more interesting because, you know, James Mason plays this doctor who kind of finds himself with some like really shady people. He has to hide out. Um, but he uses his wits and his like, you know, uh, specialty as a doctor to sort of get him out of jams, which I, I find is pretty fascinating. Like at the beginning, um, he tricks this gangster into um, saying he's been poisoned and, you know, he has the antidote. So, you know, he can't get rid of him. He can't kill him. And it kind of helps him sort of like weasel his way out of this jam. And he uses this again um, later in the movie, which again, I don't want to spoil it because it's sort of a like twist plot point, but I liked how they kind of work his being a doctor into this really interesting kind of um, crime thriller. And he also uh, helps impoverished people in um, this small Mexican village, which I thought was, was a really interesting sort of background um, for that. But it's fine. My favorite, though, was Appointment with a Shadow. And, you know, you got to keep your shadow appointments. It's very mm -hmm. important. Um, we have a commentary track from David Dakota and David DelVal. Um, and, uh, you know, David's a, a, a friend and a fan of the show. Um, he's awesome. So that was like a fun uh, treat. But this is a really interesting mix of Lost Weekend meets a crime thriller. Um, so the setup is there is this um, kind of washed out reporter and he needs to stay sober because he has an inside tip on this big crime thing that's going to happen um, with some really interesting kind of twists thrown in. And again, I don't want to like spoil anything, but it is really interesting how it kind of mixes something like Billy Wilder's Last Weekend or um, Days of Wine and Roses and uh, puts it in this sort of like ticking clock crime thriller. And I thought the melding of those two were really interesting. And uh, like I said, I think this is by far my favorite of the set just because it, it does um, stray so far from like the by the numbers sort of crime thriller is it a really great portrayal of like an alcoholic no but I mean we have better movies that talk about that I mean you know like Billy Walters last weekend but you know it's a fun sort of crime thriller version of last weekend and I like that concept a lot is it perfect no uh, it's a lot of fun I think as, as a whole this set's pretty interesting like, even if I don't love every movie in here, there always is one or two gems that makes me want to, like, have this set. So, um, really great. I think these all have commentary tracks. Let me double check. Yeah, they all have. Um, and I, I, I mean, you know, I am a total slut for commentary tracks. So uh, that's one of my favorite things. So, um, yeah, it's a really nice set. Um, Kino, once again, 
doesn't just plop these movies out. They look great. Um, they have really nice features. Um, yeah, A+. plus. Yeah, I'm just, I can't believe just that we're already up to volume 14. Mm-hmm. That is insane, but Kino keeps knocking them out of the park. So good for them. It's a good for noir fans. They've been eating well over the past few years. <laughs> um, so my next, I pretty much am sticking with, yeah, pretty much sticking with Kino for the rest of the ride. So strap in uh, my first uh, Kino Lorber title here is the more recent about 2008 i believe um nope okay don't know uh the treatment here uh which uh is interesting due to right now as we record this the tribeca film festival is going on which you are covering for us on the site uh, very well uh so check that out uh audience um but uh this film won a award at tribeca like for the best uh it's like the made in new york uh, feature narrative uh whenever it was in competition so a tribeca winner here and uh this movie is pretty solid it is kind of like a mostly harmless romantic dramedy it is about a guy it kind of almost reminds me of like a um like a Noah Baumbach light. Um, it is a a man who has like recently gotten like in the like past year or so gotten dumped. He is not really quite over it. He is um, he he's like the type of person who tries to re uh, who t- tries to like arrange like a spontaneous meetup like a uh, but like a uh, run in with his ex and stuff because he thinks that like maybe they can get together. Um, and at the beginning of the movie, he he finds out that his uh, ex has recently gotten engaged. He is going to a therapist who is like uh, played by Ian Holm, who was I was also fun because Ian Holm I just saw in Time Bandits playing Napoleon, so it's good to see him in two movies this uh, week. Uh, but he is a therapist trying to help him, but he's kind of like a like a tough love type of therapist. He's always kind of like kind of poking at the the our main character and trying to push him to like basically like not be an asshole and not be such like a uh stick in the mud like sad sack <laughs> which is like an interesting uh, uh approach for a therapist but um he ends up he's a teacher and he ends up kind of uh getting into something with a uh a, a, a mom from school who is like been recently widowed so it's kind of like they're uh their kind of romantic journey and him trying to not kind of fa- fall into old habits that are kind of self-destructive and all this type of stuff um it, it it is kind of annoying at times because the character since he is kind of self-destructive and has kind of some of these like tendencies that are not the best it can kind of like get under your skin a little bit you're like why do you have to be like this why are you acting this way why are you saying this thing but then there's also a lot of times where you do really like him, especially whenever he is in the classroom interacting with the students, you kind of understand like what the best version of him can look like and what he, under the best circumstances, if he can like get to that version of himself, he'll probably be like a really good guy. Um, uh, Famke Jansen um, plays the mom from school that he is getting uh, into a relationship with. Uh, she's very lovely. I've always liked her ever since like probably predating the original X-Men trilogy. Um but this is just like kind of a a solid but not incredible watch it i i know you found some gems at tribeca but it tribeca does seem to be a festival that's kind of like mostly like if you get something you're like oh it's it's good but it's not like great (laughs) um so this is kind of like the it's it's fine it's good type of level um I, i enjoyed watching it um but i probably wouldn't count it as like a new favorite or anything of that sort it's just serviceable uh, um so this new uh blu-ray looks pretty solid um it is like i said made in like the mid to like late uh 2000s so um pretty solid high definition master sounds good um there's a few special features there's like 10 minute of deleted scenes there is an interesting like eight minute uh, featurette on which real life therapists comment on how therapy is like depicted in this movie and kind of 
like what they do good, what they do bad. And so like, I like kind of that like as an actual bit of context just from real life therapists. And there's like a trailer. So not not too loaded, but it's a few interesting special features that kind of give a little bit of added value. Um, so it's a solid watch. I would probably recommend streaming this before buying it. And if you like it, it's a good disc, but yeah, the treatment, it's fine. <laughs> It's fine. That's that's a, the seal of approval here. Some, sometimes that's enough. <laughs> as long as it's yeah. not like, ugh. So like sometimes you just need something that's like fine. Yeah, sometimes that is just good enough. Um, yeah. I am sticking with Kino, um, with Kino Classic. that i was really excited about and um that is the oyster princess um and it also has a second um film um here they both have really stellar commentary tracks so um ernst lubitsch um i've covered some other um lubitsch films um actually pretty recently he did uh, a segment in if i had a million um from kino studio classics which was weird but entertaining. Um, so the Oyster Princess is a very famous um, Ernst Lubitsch film. It's probably a, of his German pre-Hollywood, pre-code stuff is probably touted as his, his best um, from that era. And I have to say that I definitely agree. Um, it really is a very boisterous, very body, very you know, tantalizing at times even, because this was like pre-COVID, so they could kind of get away with a little bit more and also a European film, so um, they could sort of push the limits a little bit more than probably we were even in pre-COVID um, times. You could definitely see what, where this is a... a Pro a very prototypical screwball comedy. Like, uh, I feel like people like Billy Wilder and Ernst Lubitsch, they really sort of made the blueprint to what would really be like classic screwball comedies. And, you know, this has high energy. Um, the first couple minutes, she is like literally destroying a room because she's so elated and happy. Um, there is a lot of sly um, social commentary. Um, a lot of Lubitsch kind of deals with like class and um, has a, a undercurrent of social commentary that is definitely in full force here. It is wacky. It is high energy. It is like the pacing again is, is almost breathless at 57 minutes. So just under an hour. And then we also get Meyer from Berlin, which is another even shorter film that kind of deals with husband and wife and gets a little zany. Uh, again, I feel like it's it's Ernst Lubitsch really playing with social commentary, which I thought was really fun. The commentary track from Joseph McBride, uh, he does uh, uh, commentary for both of these films. And it's, it's really great. And these films are definitely a little bit rough looking, but when you consider they're literally over 100, year, 100 years old at this point, um, I think they did a damn great job of, you know, restoring them and doing the best that they could with the material that they had. And it's just nice to have these films. I love that they are putting out the, you know, Ernst Lubitsch collection. I want more. Um, he definitely was very prolific and just having these rare German films, uh, I think is a really nice added collection to some of the more uh, mainstream Hollywood stuff 
Criterion has put out um, some of his films, um, To Be or Not To Be, um, blanking on the other ones. But, you know, again, this is just a nice sort of to fill in the gaps between, you know, his German stuff and his um, stuff from America. So um, Oyster Princess, please check it out. It's it's I highly recommend it. The other film is the other film on here is good. It's not as great, but it's just nice, again, to have more of his uh, filmography available and looking really great. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have a question for you because I thought I knew the answer and then you said something that threw me off. So I'll just ask, is this a talkie or is it a silent film? Silent. Okay. Because so I was like, okay, some of the things made me think that it was a talkie, but then you said it was over 100 years old. So I was like, okay, this is probably a silent film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's exciting. I love that uh, Kino is one of the like best labels for giving us actual like silent films because other labels seem to be afraid of it except for our, our friends at Undercrank Pictures. I know we talk about them and you're probably going to be talking to one of the head honchos over there. So, um, but we love silent films and we love that they are finally at a place where they're getting like really good representation on Blu-ray. And yeah, I would, I'm sorry. I would definitely add that if you're kind of new to silent films, um, you're maybe not sure like where to start. I, I always say comedies and horror are the best, you know, tr like starters, I think, because, you know, comedy and horror are both very physical and you know i think work best in a silent kind of setting so um if you're intimidated by silent films i say like check out a really great um like harold lloyd silent film or you know again you know this would be a good starter or uh, nosferatu um is a really great place to start but yeah um love it Yeah, and that leads actually directly into my my next title. Um, going more towards the horror side of Silent Era, this is The Trap with Lon Chaney. So that that lined up very nicely for our, our Silent Corner. Um, so um, I'll just show the interior here. Uh, according to this, this is the first starring role of Lon Chaney, which is pretty fun. The Man of a Thousand Faces. Uh, and uh, similarly to yours, this is a very short movie. It is only 53 minutes long, um, but it uses that runtime pretty well. This is a, uh, I wouldn't say it's like a straight up horror movie. It's not, it's like not Nosferatu, but it is a kind of a story of like betrayal and revenge. And uh, I, I really like it because like, um, Lon Chaney, he plays a character who's like kind of, he has a thing for this woman who uh, kind of ends up uh, kind of uh, casting him aside in favor of like another man and it kind of breaks his heart and it kind of like devolves into this, there's like a weird section where he, he steals a child and it, I almost kind of like, it, it, it's all over the place. But then eventually the the, the trap is like, him like trapping this wolf for revenge purposes which is pretty <laughs> wild like that's like the ultimate actor <laughs> revenge just trapping wolves for your own to do your bidding <laughs> uh but this is a pretty uh lively and entertaining movie it has a little bit of heart a little bit of like thrilling moments um it's just it's a pretty well-rounded time like i said it's only 53 minutes so it, you don't really feel like it drags at any point. It's just a pretty streamlined story. And that's not to say that this Blu-ray is not worth it. Uh, it is. Um, first off, it comes from a new uh, 4K restoration conducted by Universal. It looks really nice. The color uh, color tinted uh, photography looks really good. Um, a lot of like the uh, nicks and scratches and stuff have been cleaned up. There's still some here and there. 
But if you if you've seen the uh, 4K restoration that Kino put out of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's very similar in quality. It's very nice. Um, but beyond it looking good, and then it not really needing to sound great because it is a silent film, but the 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 original score that was conducted for this does hold up with really good fidelity. Um, in addition to that, there's some really good special features which kind of make this even more of a better value. There's an another uh, a twelve minute short film uh, that Lon Chaney uh, starred in that that is. Uh, called By the Sun's Rays, uh, uh, which was from 1914. Um, but then there's also probably what will push people over the edge. There is a 65-minute documentary about Lon Chaney and just kind of gives an overview of his like work. Uh, mostly, um, it's like a lot of really cool clips from some of his work. So you get like a lot of like, it's the type of thing that you'll watch that you'll just be like writing stuff down like oh i want to see that i want to see that i want to see that so that's really cool that it's a really good well-rounded documentary on lon cheney so yes the movie is less than an hour long but you have an over hour long documentary about lon cheney so that's that's a great bang for your buck you get like a full well-rounded release so um kino kino classics has done a really nice job with this so if you're a fan of lon cheney the trap is a really good one to check out um, I'm glad we got to have our double dose of silent films from like respected creative figures. Yeah, you, I mean, when you said he trapped wolves for revenge, like <laughs> I was like, I'm into it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's let's do this. Um, so uh, we're gonna get into the talkies now. Um, okay. <laughs> and um, so. I'll, I will say, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. I know we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. Enzi's main, or however you pronounce it. Um, maybe we can do like a audio, how you are supposed to pronounce it, but. Ennis. Um, I'm not gonna go hugely into in depth. Since I did have a full review of this movie, um, but I will give you uh, an overview. Um, I will say casual horror fans will probably not like this movie. It is very slow. Um, I sort of, in my review, I likened it to the movie Men. Although if, I mean, some people thought Men was a little bit too artsy, even though it's an A24 film, so what do you want? Um, this is even more so than that. And um, it, it's just a very slow burn, but I think that's, one of the things that I think really helps it thrive, I appreciate a film that um, has an older woman in, in a um, horror role that isn't like a hag or a witch or like, you know, it, it, it has a strong, you know, um, I'm trying to think how I want to put this. Like she, you know, she's an older woman that has sexual agency and she's not just um, like a punchline. Um, and indeed, I think this movie is kind of best summed up as a psychosexual nightmare. Is it? I don't know if I would quite say this is folk horror, but it very much has that folk horror vibe. And if you see the movie, you'll kind of get what I'm what I'm trying to convey here. Um, so I was a little bit disappointed that um, this is a bare bones release. Um, I would have loved a commentary track. I would have loved a Blu-ray. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they are not doing a Blu-ray of this at this time. No, nope, not yet. I was very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, um, I thought so, but I just wanted to like double check. But yeah, um, I'm grateful that this is out on physical media. It's a great movie. If you are somebody that can like hang with something that's a little more loose narrative wise, I would say absolutely just blind buy it or this might be also kind of like a try before you buy kind of situation, but I really liked it. I will um, link my full review in the description. So if you want to like hear my full thoughts on that, but uh, yeah, I, I liked it. I thought it was just such a strong, interesting film. Yeah, absolutely. I, I haven't uh, been able to catch up on that one. I was hoping to catch it when it did hit Blu-ray, but now that it is not, um, <laughs> I, I'll have to still check it out. Usually neon films seem to end up on Hulu. So I'll have to check on there if it's there yet or if it's coming soon, but um, definitely hope it maybe gets a Blu-ray in the future. If not, uh, we'll see. I'll probably still add it to my collection. Uh, but like you said, at least it's on physical media for those who do want it. 
Um, my next title, I, I'm realizing I'm like having just a lot of films either that are silent or just not in English. And I'm just going to continue that for the rest of my time. Um, this is a French film um, and this is On the Edge. Uh, and this just came out uh, within the past few years, I believe. Um, I believe this was maybe earlier this year or the end of last year. Um, and so here is the interior, nothing too crazy. Um, this one is, I really liked it. Um, it's a, I'm really in my uh, crime thriller era, uh, but uh, this is, it starts out kind of mysteriously. Um, this uh, man uh, who is our uh, main character, he plays a, a train operator who has just, um, at the beginning of the film, someone has jumped in front of his train uh, and to uh, died by suicide. Um, and from there, you kind of learn a little bit of extra context about who this man was that um, uh, jumped in front of the train, how uh, he connect, how he actually connects to the driver, and what like kind of criminal activities this person was actually wrapped up in is so it's kind of unraveling this criminal like tapestry i've seen some people compare this almost to like a taken uh, which i think this is better constructed than taken and more like interesting but it does it does kind of i don't want to reveal too much but there's just like the way you kind of learn more about our character and what his actual background is is very interesting and um there's like like I said there's a criminal element where there's also like police are investigating uh like this incident which leads to other like a connection to other cases uh but there's like I wouldn't say this is like as action packed as a taken um it is more kind of like a slow burn like in kind of investigative drama but it's like a man who is very capable tracking down leads trying to figure like carry out some form of revenge and uh it's just a really really compelling movie i really liked it there is some like like stuff blows up so if you're like you won't be bored but it's not like always like hand-to-hand -hand combat it's more kind of cerebral which i'm i can i'm vibe with uh more so than kind of like mind-numbing action a lot of the time it depends on what mood i'm in uh, but this one, I really, I was feeling it. It looks good. It sounds good on Blu-ray. Um, it's not really anything in the way of special features besides a trailer. So no additional context. But this one is worth seeking out. If you're a fan of like slow burn crime films with like some mystery, like some that you won't need to unravel. Uh, I think you'll have a good time with it. Nice. That's inter that's really interesting because it's, it's another one that wasn't on my radar, but um sounds really interesting i do like a sort of interesting sort of take on like you said like taken or something that's a little more like that but elevated um my final title i saved the best for last i try to do that i try to end on like a strong note um and you can't really i mean you are hard pressed to get any stronger than this this is the manchurian candidate uh in on 4k so um, here's the back, and um, let's open this up. So here's the discs. You do get the um, the uh, special features on a separate disc, and then the um, 4K disc. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to go into extremes on this movie because everybody's kind of knows this movie, or you know the remake. But holy crap, it is amazing. It is one of those, um, to give you some kind of context, this is post-Korean War, um, you know, paranoid thriller. Um, it's one of the few movies where Angela Lansbury plays one of the best villains. Oh my gosh, she is, I, I'm, I'm assuming you've seen this. I don't think this is a spoiler. Now, I think I've seen, I've seen the remake and I'm pretty sure I did watch the original. It's been a while and I need to rewatch it. I'm excited to, yeah. but I, I know what, you, I know what, I know what you're saying. So it won't <laughs> be a spoiler, but yeah. Well, and, and I don't think it's a spoiler, but like it, she just plays one of the most low key, but very chilling villains. And 
like there are things in this movie and again i'm trying to be vague but there is um, brainwashing. There is a scene that still kind of gives me the chills where, you know, it's kind of presented in this sort of dreamlike logic where the, the um, you know, guy is just like killing these people, these like military guys in a row, just robotically executing them. Um, and, oh my gosh, it just, it still just gives me the chills because it's so mechanical and matter of fact in the way it's filmed and presented and there's no emotion to that scene and I, I mentioned that scene in particular just because I feel like that kind of sums up how um, the director really just knew how to handle this material in a way that is chilling and you know scary but in a way that doesn't feel over the top it is kind of grounded in some kind of reality you know this um has um this was 1962 so this was just right after uh janet lee did psycho in 1960 and uh she's great um i'm not uh, i will say uh i'm not the biggest sinatra fan um don't come for me that's just my preference but he's really good in this um i think he, his character i think you know his bravado that I sometimes really don't like. I think it's it's in service of this character, um, so uh, it doesn't grate on me as much. Um, oh my gosh, it is such a classic! Uh, if y'all haven't seen it, just this is one of those that like I would just say blind buy, just buy it. You won't regret it. It's so it's such such a great movie. Um, who owns the what? What studio was the remake? Um, do you recall? Uh, yeah, that was Paramount, the one with Denzel and Meryl Streep and yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, it it would have been cool if they could have done a double feature, but I understand with licensing, it's very tricky. Um, the special features are really fantastic. Um, I love that we get um, a William Freakin interview on the bonus disc. Um, he's always a good time to listen to. You get um, an interview with the uh, sadly now late Angela Lansbury, but it's stuff like that that is just, I, I treasure so much. And this is such a great release. Um, it looks fantastic. Um, I've seen this many movie many times and I feel like I can say with confidence, this is the best this has ever looked. Um, yeah, just, I mean, yeah, don't hesitate. Just buy it. Um, I am so beyond thrilled that this is uh, released. So, Yeah, and this is another example of Kino snagging those 4K rights away from the Criterion Collection. So if you have that old disc, I assume that there's probably some special features that didn't carry over, which isn't my case. I do have that Blu-ray. Uh, so I'll, keep, I'll hold on to that for the special features. But uh, I'm glad that this movie is finally out on 4K. That is very exciting. Uh, my final title, once again, Italian crime thriller. It's all I'm talking about. <laughs> um, this is from 1972. Um, and this is Caliber 9 uh, from Raro Video and Kino, Kino Lorber. Uh, Raro Video has been really killing it um, the past uh, probably year or so when they really started ramping up uh, production again. Uh, because the first few years when I was uh, getting into reviewing stuff, I didn't really know about them. But then like within the last year, I'm just like, oh, they've just like been like releasing a ton of stuff that I've been really enjoying. Um, and this one is probably considered one of the like upper tier of a Italian, uh, Italian crime films. Um, it has like a, it's not like an, a completely innovative narrative, but it's told very well. It's about a, uh, it's about a criminal who has just recently gotten out of prison who um, before, right before he went into prison, he's like part of like kind of this um, kind of crime syndicate family. Um, he was accused of stealing this like $300,000 like money exchange, like drop because this money went missing and he was probably about to get like, like viciously beaten for this money, but he got, like sent to prison first so as soon as he gets out he is like right back in the throes of like hey where's this money you stole and he like he swears he did not take it and but like all signs point to him like hey you were the only person on this route that probably could have taken it and then it just kind of like 
uh, evolves from there and just like kind of seeing like did he or did he not take it it will he be able to like prove his innocence if he is innocent um what what steps will these like criminals take to get their money back and then like he kind of like he's trying to uh, may potentially go on the straight and narrow as well so he's dealing with like criminals on one side police who are worried about him like going back to a life of crime on the other and then like some old acquaintances who like are kind of neutral and then just like seeing all these elements come into play it's it's done very well um some of the characters can like be a little bit into kind of caricature um a little bit like over the top villainy but overall i like kind of like the internal ethics of this movie and people like they do have their own codes like like their own sense of like honor and stuff which i i find very interesting it's directed very well it's not overly long it is like uh an hour and 43 minutes it's paced very well a lot of good like a good mixture of like um interpersonal drama with like some like shootouts and stuff just a really well made italian crime thriller so um, this comes from a, a 4K restoration. Um, it looks really nice. I didn't see a lot in the way of like nicks or scratches. Um, the grain is resolved well. It's just in a very, it's very good shape. Um, this comes with uh, both uh, the original Italian and an English dub. Um, I switched back and forth to see how they sounded. The Italian sounds like a lot better, uh, not beyond just personal preference of like sticking with the original language. It's a more robust track. The English sounds a little bit thin, but it is there if you do uh, want a dub. Um, this also has a pretty good number of special features. There's um, a different, like a uh, one 30 minute documentary, um, one uh, 39 minute. Um, there's another 20 minute uh, featurette. Uh, about the making of the movie um, so there's a different aspects of the um, the film kind of explored um, all in pretty good depth um, there's some photos photo gallery um, yeah pretty solid presentation all all around so if you're a fan of the genre caliber number nine is a pretty solid one it's one of the better like a, italian crime thrillers i've seen this rare video release is very good and yeah so uh in, that ends my reign of crime <laughs> um yes we can all like dylan's reign of terror is over we are safe um <laughs> yeah. um and yeah i guess that kind of does it for this episode this was like i mean i say this every week but this was a fun one i there was just like i love the wide range of titles and if you enjoy this we do this every week um, so please, you know, subscribe, likes, comments, all that stuff um, is very much appreciated. Um, that really helps, um, you know, get more eyeballs on this um, show and the, and the channel. And uh, as always, uh, you know, thank you for hanging out with us.